Hello everyone and welcome to Quick Med, where medicine is explained quickly and easily. Today we will be discussing SIADH, which can be a confusing topic, but hopefully will make things a little bit clearer. Before we get started, if you find this video helpful, please make sure to like and subscribe so that we can keep doing what we're doing. Alright, let's get into it. SIADH occurs when there is impaired water excretion caused by an inability to suppress ADH secretion. To understand this a little bit more, we first need to understand how ADH works. ADH, or antidiuretic hormone, is secreted in response to an increased serum osmolality as well as decreased blood pressure. Those are the major stimuli that will cause ADH secretion. Angiotensin II also can lead to ADH secretion, but that plays more of a minor role. And in response to these stimuli, ADH will lead to water reabsorption, and it does this by inserting aquaporin channels in the distal tubule and the collecting duct. ADH also leads to vasoconstriction, which helps when the blood pressure is low, but we'll mainly be talking about how it helps with water reabsorption. Let's take a look at a very simplified version of a nephron to understand how ADH works here. Our nephron consists of our glomerulus, proximal convoluted tubule, our loop of Henle, distal convoluted tubule, and our collecting duct. And ADH leads to the insertion of aquaporin channels into the medullary collecting duct, which allows fluid or water to move down its concentration gradient. And the reason there's a concentration gradient is because the medullary interstitium of the kidney is very concentrated. And this is a result of the loop of Henle and how it functions. So make sure to keep this in mind because when we talk about treatment options, this will make a lot more sense as well. All right, so let's see what happens as a result of this. So we said with SIADH, we have an elevated ADH level, which leads to volume expansion. As a result of this volume expansion, there is an increased urinary sodium excretion that occurs through inhibition of the RAS system. This helps return the extracellular fluid volume back to its normal level, but also lowers the plasma sodium concentration as a result, which is what we end up seeing. So patients with SIADH will present with hyponatremia, and they can range from being asymptomatic to symptomatic, and these symptoms can vary. Patients can have more minor symptoms like a headache, nausea, vomiting, some dizziness and confusion, to some more severe symptoms like seizures and coma, and this typically occurs at really low sodium levels. So how do we diagnose SIADH? SIADH will typically present with hyponatremia, which is less than 135, a low serum osmolality, which is less than 280, a high urine osmolality, which will be greater than 100, and a high urine sodium. Because as we mentioned, the body responds to this increased volume expansion by excreting more sodium in the urine. And in terms of volume status, patients with SIADH will be euvolemic. And if you think about it, this is because if a patient comes in hypovolemic from vomiting, diarrhea, or other causes, ADH will be elevated in that case. However, that would be an appropriate increase in ADH in order to respond to decreased volume status. So for it to really be a case of SIADH, the patient's volume status should not be one that would lead to a physiologic increase in ADH. Here, the ADH elevation is inappropriate. And just keep in mind, SIADH is a diagnosis of exclusion, so you need to rule out all other causes before you consider SIADH. And this typically involves ruling out any thyroid disorders or any adrenal insufficiency. Now, what are some causes of SIADH? The most common causes that you'll see are a CNS disturbance, such as with a stroke, hemorrhage, infection, or trauma. Another commonly tested one is malignancy, particularly small cell carcinoma of the lung. Medications can also cause this, uh, particularly SSRIs, anti-epileptics, sulfonylureas, and even opioids. And interestingly, in cases of CNS disturbance or malignancy, SIADH can be a chronic cause. However, sometimes it can actually be transient in response to things like nausea and pain. This isn't something that you're likely going to be tested on, but it's just an interesting thing to know for when you're on the wards. So let's say we have a patient coming in with hyponatremia and we've ruled out other causes and do think this is SIADH, how would we go about treating this? To understand the treatment options, we really need to understand how the kidney functions. So let's say you have a patient who follows a typical Western diet and eats about 700 milliosms a day, which is the amount of milliosms that has to be excreted. Because the amount of solute taken in is the amount of solute that has to be taken out. Now the kidney can generate urine from anywhere between 50 to 1200 milliosms per kilogram, depending on the ADH level. So if we're at a minimal ADH level and we take 50 milliosms per kilogram, this person can produce about 14 liters per day. However, if we look to the right side of the spectrum where we have maximal ADH, then the urine can be concentrated up to 1,200 milliosms per kilogram. So considering this, if we divide 700 milliosms by 1,200 milliosms per kilogram, we get about 0.5 liters. This means that this patient can only excrete about 0.5 liters of urine per day. 
And this is typically the situation that we see with SIADH, where there's an inappropriate elevation in ADH levels, and so the urine output is going to be minimal, and the urine concentration is going to be very high. So one way we can treat this is to limit the patient's fluid intake to match the amount of fluid that they actually can put out in their urine. And this is often the first-line treatment option for most patients with SIADH who are asymptomatic or have very mild hyponatremia. Another way that we can treat this is to increase the solute load by giving salt tablets. So in this situation, we increase the milliosms from 700 to 1200. And just keep in mind, these numbers were chosen arbitrarily in order to make the math a little bit easier. By going from 700 to 1200 milliosms, the patient can now increase their urine output from half a liter to a liter and get more water off. Salt tablets are often added as a second line treatment after fluid restriction if fluid restriction does not work that well. A third thing we can do is to actually give diuretics. And interestingly, loop diuretics are actually the best option for patients with SIADH. And let's revisit our diagram of the nephron to understand why this is. As we said, ADH inserts aquaporin channels in the collecting duct, which allows water to move down its concentration gradient because of the medullary concentration gradient created by the loop of Henle. Loop diuretics, as their name implies, actually work at the loop of Henle, so they short circuit that medullary concentration gradient we discussed. So even though there's such a high ADH level, there's less water that gets reabsorbed. Loop diuretics actually work better than thiazide diuretics, which work more at the distal convoluted tubule because those don't really get at the loop of Henle and affect the medullary concentration gradient. So let's recap the treatment options already discussed. We said that fluid restriction is the first line treatment. You can add salt tablets on top of that if it doesn't really work that well. And loop diuretics are also another option to consider. Hypertonic saline is another treatment option, but this is really only given in cases of severe hyponatremia where the serum sodium levels are very low and patients are presenting with symptoms like seizures. Vaptans are another class of medications that can also be used, and they work as ADH antagonists. However, they're not usually given as first-line treatments because they're expensive and they have been associated with liver toxicity. For most test questions, the main treatment options that you'll really need to know are fluid restriction and salt tablets. The others are really just more for your own benefit for when you're on the wards and really want to have a more comprehensive understanding of SIADH treatment. All right, so let's go over our practice question to solidify our understanding of this. We have a 72-year-old male who was admitted after undergoing a right knee replacement. There are no intraoperative complications. His pain is well controlled on opioids and a urinary catheter is in place. All right, so here I already have a patient who's undergone surgery and is under pain medications at the moment. And as we discussed, SIADH can be a transient issue in cases of stress like nausea or pain, which can be caused by surgery. He's also receiving opioids, which we said can be linked to SIADH. Five hours later, his nurse notes a decrease in urine output. Vital signs are stable and the patient is awake and responsive. So here they're telling us that the urine output has gone down and that the patient is asymptomatic. He's doing fine. Laboratory testing reveals the following, a sodium of 129, potassium 3.4, glucose 112, bicarb 24, BUN 8, and serum osmolality of 270. Here, while the potassium is a little bit low, I'm really more concerned about the sodium, which is 129, and the serum osmolality, which is on the lower end. UA shows a urine sodium of 41 and an osmolality of 500. So we see here that we have an elevated urine sodium greater than 40 and an osmolality of 500, which is well above the 100 range that we discussed. What is the most appropriate next step in management? So as you can see, this is a twofold question where you need to know what the diagnosis is and then how to manage that diagnosis. While realistically, we would probably rule out a few other causes first before we call this SIADH, the question stem here is really pointing towards SIADH for the reasons already mentioned. So the most appropriate next step here in a patient with a mild case of hyponatremia and who's asymptomatic would be to do some fluid restriction. All right, everyone, I hope you found this helpful. This can be a confusing topic, so feel free to rewatch the video if you need to. As always, good luck studying.